Here we go. I might be ready. And without further ado, hello and welcome to the Hackaday Podcast. I'm Elliot Williams. And I'm Christina Ponos. This is episode 261, Rickroll Toothbrush, Keyboard Cat, and Zombie Dial-Up. This week in the news, a couple stories. One, how powerful should an electric bike be? The UK is asking. Jenny wrote this up because there's new legislature looking to raise the power limit from 250 watts to 500 watts for electric bikes. And I'm shocked it's so low. I think my son's hoverboard is like 350 watts. Wow. Electric bikes should have way more juice than that. (laughs) More power. So it's interesting. But in the article, Jenny also says that this is a European law that bikes can't have more than 250 watts to be still classified as bikes. And I don't know, man. I see them zipping around. I don't believe a word of it. Somebody's cheating somewhere. (laughs) If any of our listeners know, write us in. And speaking of trouble, Yuzu and Citra emulators shut down after legal pressure from Nintendo. Yuzu was a really neat project. It emulated the Nintendo Switch, everything except some proprietary ROMs inside the Switch. So you could run Switch games on other platforms, uh, especially Steam Deck, I think. But to do it, you had to dump the ROM from an actual Nintendo Switch. And this was their way of getting around the copyright issues that are kind of obviously here. And I think Nintendo is basically arguing in court that there's no other use for this emulator if you don't dump their ROMs and use it. And that's, I think they got them this time. And I think, I think it's a bummer because it's really neat to be able to run your Switch games on other platforms. And actually the really old versions, the version one of the Nintendo Switch was fairly easily hackable. So you could dump the video games, the ROMs from the video games that you actually legally own and play them on other devices. But you couldn't do that without some of this other Switch secret sauce ROM. And apparently that is the bit that Nintendo is objecting to here. So good news, bad news. I don't think it's going to kill all emulators out there, but I think it's definitely, I I think the team behind this does not have the legal power to stand up against the gigantic two and a half million dollar lawsuit from Nintendo. So they're doing probably the right thing and just going to fold up, call it a day. And bringing up the rear, the Hackaday Home Automation Contest is into, what is it, week three or so by now. We've seen a bunch of projects and started writing them up on our very own pages. Do you have an idea how many are in there? I haven't looked at the spreadsheet in a few days. Oh, let's just see. It was a baker's dozen before. I think there's at least two baker's dozen. It was an enumerate baker's dozen before. 28. Hungry, hungry baker. (laughs) So we have a bunch of entries into the home automation contest already, but if you aren't among them, head on over to Hackaday.io, find the home automation contest, and start up a project and pull the little pull-down menu to enter it. Does it have to be a new project? It doesn't have to be a new project. Okay. We, and we've never done a home automation contest before, so it's not like I even have to say it should be substantially different from the last time. So no, go nuts. What if you've already entered it in another contest? Yeah, it's always cool to add new stuff to it, but I don't think we're requiring it. Okay. Anything else? Um, I don't think so. Ooh, what's that sound? Let's head on over to what's that sound. This is a journey into sound. What's that sound? What's that sound? This week's what's that sound comes complete with misleading background commentary. Here another poll. Kaboom, what do we got? Mmm. That sure sounds like the coin slot on like a pool table or a Ooh. washing machine or a dryer. Oh, that's brilliant. I'm gonna have to do that sometime. <laughs> that's what it sounds like to me. That's a great sound. I will do that in a non-specific future number of weeks. Okay. Cool. You got the all mechanical aspect right. It's a slightly more involved machine than that. And I think that's Hmm. all I should say. Okay. Ah, it's in my brain. It's in there. I'm out of Christina's brain. (laughs) I don't know. I don't know. You got me. It's A, B, 
Beep. Oh, okay. It's one of those old slide the thingy thing. Sure. Hmm. We may have established that all mechanical machines all sound the same. Maybe. (laughs) (laughs) What do you think, listeners? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Well, if you listeners out there have an idea, head on over to hackaday.com slash podcast. You'll find a What's That Sound form. Fill it out with your name and your guess. And next week, we will pick among the right answers and someone will get a Hackaday podcast t-shirt. Well, my first hack this week is one that we've seen kind of danced around before it's been tantalizingly close and this is the first (laughs) time we've seen it done this is hacking an actual wi-fi toothbrush with an esp32 dash c3 this is a project by aaron christofel he actually gets doom running on a wi-fi slash bluetooth electric toothbrush the day we've all been waiting for (laughs) we've seen people cheat their way around a bunch of small devices like this but he actually finally found the ideal candidate toothbrush and this is one that uh it actually has all sorts of crazy functions that you know log how your toothbrushing ability is it actually has a sibling toothbrush made by the same company that does pressure logging and so it can see how hard you're pressing the toothbrush on your teeth it's like i think it's intended for kids to keep them from like brushing too hard i think that's actually pretty awesome that's one of the cooler things i've seen in a toothbrush this one isn't that though this is just another you know your standard run-of-the-mill wi-fi slash bluetooth enabled toothbrush he says let's see what enabled the hack here is that a the toothbrush runs on an esp32 on the inside which of course if you think about it is ideal if you need a wi-fi and bluetooth enabled device What really enables the hack, though, is some horribly lax security on the part of the makers. They equipped it with an automatic firmware uploading mode that looks around for an ESSID for a wireless hotspot with a given name. Once it finds that name, it logs in with a password and it downloads whatever firmware it can find there and flashes itself with it. Aaron uses this to, well, he just makes a hotspot with the right ESSID and password and boom that's the whole game over it's beautiful you don't have to hack anything you don't have to even open the device up you can just flash firmware to it simply by (laughs) naming your router to whatever it was evolver or whatever and setting the default password to one two three four five six seven eight classy security classy (laughs) Okay, I'm going to complain about the security of a Wi-Fi toothbrush. Honestly, nobody is in your bathroom trying to hack your toothbrush. (laughs) So I I think it's like, you know, it's a security fail in big air quotes, but like it's a very low consequence security (laughs) fail. So in that sense, I think it's actually totally fine. And of course, the upshot that comes out of Aaron's hack here is that now it's an electric toothbrush with a completely and very easily hackable firmware in it. And that's the part that I think is really cool about this. I want to see people coming up with custom electric toothbrush firmware. Did I mention it has an OLED on it? (laughs) This is going to be so cool. We're all going to be like trading custom electric toothbrush ROMs pretty soon. (laughs) You think so? That's the future we're going to live in. I hope so. Okay. My toothbrush has a, you're brushing too hard indicator, and it's just that the motor sounds different. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, right? Yeah, ours has some kind of Bluetooth thing, but it required their phone app to hook up to it, and frankly, we just never bothered. (laughs) Anyway, it's it's awesome. We can't have flying cars, but we can have (laughs) LED display toothbrushes. (laughs) That we can remotely take over by renaming hotspots. One step at a time, I guess. I don't yeah, know. Yeah, I, th- I think it's an awesome consolation prize. Again, I'm looking forward to it. I'm going to buy one. You can send me the awesomest toothbrush ROMs you can think up and I'll run them. Okay. Now that I think about it, our electronic toothbrush has a, you know, it's got to vibrate four times. So once per mouth quadrant or something. Yeah. It's not. Ours does it too fast. I can't get around my mouth as fast as it wants me to and like conscientiously brush each tooth. This may be oversharing, but I would love to reset it so that it would give me just like seven, eight seconds more per part of my mouth. Or better still, you could have one that does like, you know, inside, top, outside, inside, top, outside for the two halves of your mouth. 
I could totally customize the vibrating routine on that thing. Yeah. Okay. And have it Rick roll me at the same time. Like this is this is actually totally useful. I mean, I would play upbeat music loudly because you have to hear it over the toothbrush. You could use the vibrate yeah. mode to like vibrate the music into your teeth. Whoa. Yeah. That'd be cool. I'm getting into this. This is the beginning. This is the beginning of a new era. My first hack comes from Sebastian Sokolowski. Piano feeder gets pets playing for their supper. Well, specifically cats. Anyway, Sebastian was asked to miss, make this by someone who wanted to see whether they could teach their cat a new skill. And we all remember the cat piano, right? So this yeah. is basically what it says on the tin. Cat presses button, receives kibble. Although it's important to note that it's not necessary that they play for their food. They will get fed no matter what they do or don't do. The entertaining part for humans is that they press one key and it plays the few notes of a tune, like, for instance, for release. So that's pretty cool to hear randomly while your cat wants to eat. Uh, the biggest issue that Sebastian had while making this was creating a dispenser that didn't jam. And to do that, he did a number of things, including adding a second agitator and some flexible brushes to keep the food moving. But there's also a software safeguard. If the motor jams, it reverses briefly to unjam itself. So that's pretty cool, too. Plus, uh, this thing looks beautiful to me. I, I love it. It looks great. Plus, it Did gets us it? more keyboard playing cats on the internet. I mean... Well, yeah. <laughs> And so you're not going to believe this, but I have the perfect link to go along with this one. It was oh, yeah. an article by Ann Ogborn, Handling Bulk Material, Why Does My Cat Food Get Stuck? And it discusses, among other things, the physics of making hoppers that don't get stuck. And this is exactly like the cat food feeder is the canonical problem for this in kind of <laughs> the hacker space. And this is the answer to A, how that happens, and B, how to design around and avoid it. And it's really neat. The basic answer is you need to make the slippery sides of the funnel steeper so that they slope better. They, of course, can't be too steep and they can't be too not steep. And so getting that bit <laughs> right is dependent. It actually also depends on your material. And there is a, what would she call it? There's an actual name for the parameter of how much the different particles like to stick to each other and kind of interleave with each other. And like cat food with those little like star-shaped corners is one of those horrible, horrible foods that tend to uh, <sighs> cohere internally and uh, get you out of the funnel flow mode, which is what you want. Favorite part about this article actually was learning a new new term, which is when the stuff that's around the outside of the funnel sticks and it's the funnel walls aren't steep enough and it doesn't flow down so it can't push itself to the center hole but the center hole clears itself out that's called a rat hole and it's called a stable rat hole of course if it you know sticks permanently and so then you get this funnel that's just like all material around the outside except for the part that was able to fall straight through the middle straight <laughs> down the rat hole I, I love it i love it anyway cats playing pianos good cat food funnel design difficult and go go hagaday you can learn about avoiding rat holes my cat food is stuck i wish there were an article on hagaday to help me get my cat food unstuck Ta-da! well my next hack is can't disable dji drone id spoof it with an esp this is a project by JJ Schutz to spoof DJI's drone ID. I think it was before the war in the Ukraine, but this may actually be a, an unfortunate war spinoff. A lot of DJI drones after, I think, 2023 started coming with drone ID where it reads the GPS coordinates off and then broadcasts it out. The idea is here is that you can always tell where your drone is, which sounds good unless you're trying to keep other people from knowing where your drone is, which, for instance, the Ukrainian army was trying to do. But nonetheless, DJI drones broadcast out their GPS ID. And if you didn't want, for some reason, someone to know exactly where your drone is, you would be out of luck because these days it's hard coded unless you follow this project, which is to create fake drone ID messages using an ESP board, for instance. You can 
put the board up on your drone and it's going to broadcast out 16 other drones around it you know saying oh i'm a drone here oh i'm a drone here oh i'm a drone here you know potentially hiding your drone in the haystack of the fake ones of course you know which drone is yours so it's not a problem for you to figure out where your drone is if you want to use the service it just confuses other people who you might not want to be listening in what i thought was really cool about this project is kind of just how simple it is right it's an esp a little bit of code and boom, you're done. I kind of wish it were more complicated though, in a way. I, I went looking into it to see if the ESP was actually listening to your drone's GPS position and broadcasting the fake drones around it. Instead, it looks like the GPS coordinates are preset into a web page. So you tell it where you're gonna be flying and it makes the 16 drones kind of in an area around that. I wish it were listening to the actual drone's GPS and kind of like fuzzing it and adding them always in a cloud around it. I think that would be really fun. You'd see a, you know, a wandering cloud of 17 <laughs> drones if you were listening in. I think that'd be pretty sweet. I have no idea why, but I really now want to just like put these all around town and just like randomly spoof drones flying all around town where they totally aren't. <laughs> Because uh -oh. I, <laughs> I might have an incident on your hands. Yeah, part of the other intrigue with the DJI drone ID thing is that DJI said, oh no, this stuff is encoded. Nobody could possibly eavesdrop on it. And then, of course, it was trivially hacked, and everybody in the world can totally eavesdrop on it. Oh. It's one of those things where I don't know. I don't want to get too conspiratorial about why they're doing this, but I will leave that up to the motivated listener. <laughs> For my next hack, I chose Hackaday alum Jeremy Cook's Pico Kalimbas. Thumbs up to this Pico MIDI Kalimba. Actually, Jeremy made a pair of Pico MIDI Kalimbas. There's a really small one that looks pretty difficult to have made, and a much larger one that features a cat sound hole. Did you know that Kalimbas are native to the Shona people of Zimbabwe? I did not. They are. <laughs> In the touch version... Jeremy utilized the capacitive touch properties of the Raspberry Pi Pico and just added a 1 mega ohm resistor to each of the tines. For the second version, he actually made a PCB that incorporates the necessary resistors at SMD level and creates touch pins, so the wiring is much, is well, it's neater. And, uh, I once made an electric cigar box kalimba, a little one, and wound and potted a pickup for it. That was fun to do tell you what Ooh. maybe i can dig up a picture of that oh that'd be awesome how did you electric it I, I made a pickup for it like i i wound a i wound a pickup with magnet wire and between oh a god. pair of um like playing cards and then potted it with beeswax oh my god i think i definitely <laughs> want to see this humbucker or not big square um i don't i don't know <laughs> <laughs> i don't either it just sounded fun to say humbucker <laughs> just uh it's just a single coil so I don't, yeah, I don't know. Sorry. Sorry, people. I play the guitar. I don't play the guitar. I play at the guitar. Bring up the rear. This one is the simplest radio, but it's weird in two different ways. This is making a Christodyne radio with zinc oxide and cat's whiskers. This is a project by Ashish Dergawen. This takes a 1930s crystal radio design and makes it completely DIY. What's weird about this radio is that it used to use a combination of a parallel oscillator and tunnel diode to make it resonate at the right frequency. And that, I guess, is the Christodyne in question. It's a crystal plus a heterodyne -y thing. The tunnel diode is also pretty interesting. The important bit about the tunnel diode is that it has a bit of its operating range where it has negative resistance properties. And this is really just secret code for as you push the voltage up, less current flows through it. And it does this by being a creepy semiconductor. But the coolest part here is the way Ashish makes this creepy semiconductor. It's like an old school cat's whisker, basically. And this is using a procedure that he read about at sparkbangbuzz.com, which is Niall Steiner's website. If you haven't checked that out, you absolutely must. Link in the show notes here, and I'll talk more about that in just a sec. But back to the tunnel diode, it's a piece of zinc galvanized flashing, and you hit it with a torch, 
and that makes some funny oxides on it, and then you can probe around with a wire and find exactly the right spot. And you know you've hit the spot when it, the circuit you've built up starts vibrating at the right frequency. It's an incredibly primitive device. There is this like homemade burnt piece of metal and there is a crystal oscillator and then a couple other passive parts and that is the whole thing. It's like a true kind of crystal radio setup except unlike a lot of the other crystal radios it doesn't rely on like a capacitor coupled with the antenna for tuning sensitivity. It's a lot more sensitive. It's a lot more frequency selective because it uses this tunnel diode that you've made yourself with a torch and the crystal as a tuning element. <laughs> and so that, it's like the weirdest crystal radio and the craziest self-manufactured tunnel diode all in one. And I just thought that was a lovely, lovely, super, super low-tech, high-tech combo here. Yeah, so back to Niall Steiner for a sec. If you really, I really do recommend you head on over to his website, but he also is the co-inventor of a particularly interesting synthesizer filter, the Steiner Parker filter. And the story of this is fantastic. Back in the day, he and whoever, Parker, wanted to go up against Moog back when their synthesizer was new and make a like totally budget version and outcompete them on price. And they made this device called the Synthicon. Of course, in order to be cheap, it had a bunch of corner cutting to do. And one of them was this filter design that they made and if you aren't a big synthesizer nerd which i am the filter is kind of it makes that wow wow noise and the different kinds of filters make the wow wow sound like i don't know slippery or or more metallic or you know spacey warm like all these funny ambiguous terms that audio people use to <laughs> describe sounds good percentage of that Earthy. comes from the filter and the Steiner Parker filter is awesome because it is like on the edge of falling into chaos all the time. So it's like growly, gritty, and crazy. It's really, really super duper. <laughs> anyway, coming back to my topic, I was going to say coming full circle, but I'm not. I'm just getting the heck off my tangent. Um, so back to our topic, Ashish here built this awesome, crazy old 1930s designed radio taking the idea from Steiner's let's burn a piece of flashing and uh, use that as a cat whisker. I love it. There's just too many rabbit holes for you to go down here. But if you're at all interested in old tech radios or crazy physics slash semiconductor experiments, you can do at home with very minimal parts. There's going to be something for you here. For my last one, I chose Sporwo's a full keyboard for five dollars asterisk and in spite of the scare quotes and the asterisk someone judged my <laughs> title as clickbait i tried really hard people come on <laughs> what do you want me to do <laughs> what else could you do you could put I, not I, I in know. quotes i don't know it, i'll stand up for you on this one you're in the right thank here you. thank you thank you well so you've heard of the pcb business card here comes the business keyboard card how, how, how did Sporwo make this? Well, this isn't their first rodeo with tiny keyboards. And they did heavy cost analysis on the previous one. But ultimately, the answer here is in the microcontroller, which is the CH552. It costs very little to buy. And you only need, like, two capacitors to use it or something like that. In the cost analysis, Sporwo found that most of the cost comes from the switches. So they found some cheaper ones, but ultimately paid the price. Because it turned out that they weren't so great. They require a greater travel and actuation, actuation force than the previous switches. And they were scratchy to boot. They were also unreliable. But fortunately, the <laughs> scratchiness was smoothed out with Crytox. So there's that. Anyway, yeah, it looks like Lego, but it's but it's not. It looks awesome, actually. I, I think anyone complaining about what came out of this <laughs> based on the title is a bad person. <laughs> because it's such a it's such a rad little keyboard and like yeah okay the switches may not be perfect this may not be your daily driver you're saying no. what like this thing is it's credit card size it's not gonna be your daily driver but it just looks so oh, cute no. it is cute it's so cute it's the cutest 
my first quick hack this week comes from Concrete Dog. This one is the $16 PCB robot. And this is a sweet project because it gets you over the hard part of making a little, you know, desktop exploratory robot. Or I guess I should say hard parts because one of them is the wiring and the other is often the physical build. This puts them both into one thing by making the PCB the frame for the robot itself. You just attach the motors to it and of course that handles the wiring for you too. Next up, a simple hack for running low power gear from a USB battery. Pat H ran into a problem that I think a bunch of people have run into lately, which is that battery packs these days turn themselves off when they have very low current. And that's, of course, to keep them from discharging if there's, you know, some BS stray leakage. But what if you're running a micro power project? And so there's two ways you could think of trying to keep your USB battery power bank from shutting out on you one of them which is the brute force way is what pat h takes here which is just to solder a resistor across it so it's always drawing a little bit of current and that keeps it from shutting down i've seen a couple people i think both great scott and andreas spies have done videos on replacing the output sense resistor there so you can make it so that the battery power bank shuts down at a lower minimum current. And that's probably the right way to do it if you're pl leaving something plugged in for a long time that's only being turned on infrequently. But if you're just plugging it in, using it, and then unplugging it, Pat's solution here is quicker, easier, and doesn't involve modifying the power bank at all. But really, he's just putting a load resistor across it. And last up, Christian Nerdig reverse engineering Behringer's Ultranet protocol I guess people thought that Behringer's digital audio protocol was proprietary. It's only kind of proprietary. It turns out it's an older standard, AES slash EBU, but they're running it, they've adapted it to run over Ethernet twisted pairs, which is kind of interesting. So Christian dug deep into it, wanted to make his own 16-channel mixer. He does that himself. This is also a case where it requires a lot of fast data shuttling, and he ends up using one of the Arduino Maker 4000 or 3000 series FPGA-equipped little microcontroller slash FPGA prototype boards. And this is one of the very rare cases that we've seen those actually used in the wild for a hack. But here it just has to handle a lot of data really fast, and it's the perfect fit. So sweet bit of reverse engineering and sweet use of a seldom seen but tantalizingly powerful part. So my first quick hack comes from Tim Van de Vathorst. RGB LED disco ball reacts to sound and color. Ah, disco. At least we kept the ball, right? Right. This one <laughs> reacts to sound and color, though, so it's streets ahead of the standard disco ball. It does tons of cool effects. The only problem is that the color sensor needs light, so it's a little bit difficult to use at parties. But Tim might add a spotlight to a future version. Next up is Simon Brim's optical guitar pickup works with nylon strings. Uh, you have a couple of options with a nylon string guitar. You can't use an electric pickup. You can put a mic in front of the sound hole. You can use a piezo on the soundboard. Or you can do something like this, make an optical pickup. This relies on the string interrupting light traveling between an LED and a phototransistor. And Simon uses this to generate a voltage according to the string's frequency. I think the demo sounds good, maybe just slightly dampened to my ears, but I think it sounds really good. And lastly, Digital Geek brings us Luggable Cyberdeck can still be a Luggable PC. Remember the Luggable? Of course you do. If you listeners do not, these are suitcase computers where the keyboard folded up in one way or another, either on a hinge like this, or just connected by a usually curly cord. And to be clear, this one is not gutted. All of the chassis, the CRT, the power supply, and the ISA backplane are all original, and Digital Geek even has all the old parts still anyway. <laughs> All right, that brings us to our Campus articles. These are long-form pieces written by our own fantastic Hackaday writing staff. 
This week, I'm picking Jenny's next entry in her Daily Drivers series where she tests out oddball operating systems. This is Damn Small Linux 2024. And Damn Small Linux, or DSL as she keeps calling it, confusing me with the bad slow dial-up protocol of old, appeared sometime <laughs> in the early 2000s. Yeah, right? Foreshadowing. Ooh. Damn Small Linux appeared sometime in the early 2000s as a super tiny distribution. I think it was in 50 megabytes back in the day. You could put it on like a mini disk or something. <laughs> Not quite a floppy, but, you know, it's tiny, tiny, tiny. And it did that by being, you know, kind of super focused. All the tools it had with it were very rudimentary, etc. Nowadays, Damn small Linux 2024, well, everything's gotten bigger. It's 700 megs, but it'll still fit on a CD-ROM if you have a CD-ROM drive to fit it on. 700 megs will fit on any thumb drive, though, so maybe that's practical. And it's used this extra space to kind of increase the utility of a lot of the software it comes pre-installed with. It uses a weird browser called Bad Wolf that I have never seen before, but the other kind of like office productivity applications and stuff are actually all pretty straightforward. It uses ABI Word and numeric and stuff like this. It's actually, my guess would be pretty usable out of the box. Jenny says that this version is still pretty alpha feeling and not everything works together as well as she wishes it would. In particular, she had some sketchy old laptop that it wouldn't support the Wi-Fi for, so she just lost out on that entirely. Flashed it on another computer, and it worked just fine. So, you know, your mileage will probably vary. The last thing that's neat, though, about the new damn small Linux is while the previous one was tiny, kind of monolithic, and, you know, what you got was what you got, the new version comes with an actual package installation procedure and it's kind of piggybacked on Debian. So anything that works in Debian, you can install fairly easily into damn small Linux. And that actually makes it sound kind of interesting to me because it gives you kind of a minimal base that you can work with. But then if you need other software added over the top that isn't provided for you, it gives you a simple path to get that done. And that's kind of more in the flavor of, you know, some bigger, not aimed at being lightweight distributions like Arch Linux or something like that, except this one starts off even smaller. So if you have a crappy old laptop, and it's funny because a friend of mine just asked me this question last week. He's like, what's the smallest distribution I can run on this crappy old laptop that I want to give to my kids? <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, I don't know. I'll have to look around. And then boom, Jenny comes up with an article on a brand new version of damn small Linux. So very, very cool. Useful to me to be able to recommend it to a friend. But if you have any super minimal, super small distributions you're interested in, head on over to hagaday.com slash podcast and leave them in the comments. For my long form article, I chose Lou and Days. Dial up is still barely, just barely a thing. Lou and explored the still available dial up options in the States for those in rural areas or areas where it's just too expensive or what have you to build the infrastructure. Um, actually, my brother is kind of in one of these areas. He's in the, he's in a college town, but he's kind of on the north side of a college town in like the farm area. And he just doesn't have, they just don't have internet options. So, but if you do need dial-up today, your options are Net Zero, they're still around, and Juno, yes, that Juno, the one that started out in the 90s offering an email-only client. That's what I had at first, good times. So today, dial-up costs about 30 bucks a month, but that's, of course, on top of the monthly fee for the line itself, which is a lot more than $30 a month these days. But then, of course, you'll need a modem. And there are software modems out there, but you're probably better off with, like, a U.S. robotics number or something similar. And then, but then what are you doing on dial-up? What, like, what can you seriously do these days? I'd be curious to know how fast uh, Retro Hackaday loads, or, like, old Reddit. I still use old Reddit. I can't stand new Reddit. Surely that loads pretty well, over 56k. I mean, probably the pictures don't expand very quickly <laughs> and load, but... <laughs> 
<laughs> but, you know, all the text should, I would think. And how much longer do we think dial-up will even be around? Does it is it one of those things where it's going to have to be around for like a like what was AT&T's um they have minimal like minimal phones are safety critical things, right? You have to be able to call the fire department when your house is on fire. Yeah. So Yeah. Yeah. But you have to be able to get to the internet fast when you need cat videos. <laughs> or at all. Well, I mean, if it's if it's like dial up or nothing, and there's no dial up anymore, that's a, that's a problem. I think. I actually absolutely think that access to the internet is probably probably something like a fundamental human right at this point in time. Like it's it's almost impossible to do anything without. I mean, maybe there should be like at least mandatory dial up rules for places that don't have anything else. I have to say, I absolutely love joe kim's art for this one it is so yeah. <laughs> hilarious it's a uh, slowly online and it's a parody of the aol dude and he's with a cane and he's fallen and he can't get up absolutely hilarious we're probably gonna get the pants suit of off of us for this one but it was worth it and that wraps it up for this week's hackaday podcast thanks very much for listening as always, you can find the links over at hackaday.com slash podcast, and you are encouraged to send us tips, tips at hackaday.com. And until next week, keep on hacking. That's so good. Oh, that's a good sign to put the mic down to use my hands. You're really holding the mic? I must. I must. Can you like set it up in your shoe? Chris Gamble did that once. We, we have standards here at Hackaday. Or maybe smell your shoes. I don't know what it is. It looks like the GPS coordinates. One more time. You know, they stopped sp making SpaghettiOs with sliced Franks. I can't believe that. Uh-oh, SpaghettiOs? Yeah, that's a bummer, but I'm going to have to talk about resistors for a minute.